السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وبعد Brothers and sisters welcome to another live edition of your program Ask Oda Our phone numbers is 0020238555 131 or 132 The Facebook page is DR Muhammad Salah Official Um I do remember having a couple of pending questions from the previous episode. The first was from uh, Shawana from Nigeria. She asked, is it allowed to perform Sunnah prayer in congregation in order to motivate uh, others to do it? Um, to answer this, we need to understand that at uh, the or the supererogatory prayers or the Sunnah, the Nafl in general, uh, in this regard are divided into two categories. A part of that which um, it is prescribed to pray in congregation as Salatul Kusuf, the sun or the moon eclipse prayer, Salatul Istisqa, the prayer of seeking the, the rain, the two Eids prayer, and the night prayer, Salatul Taraweeh, especially during Ramadan, and uh, the winter prayer. With regards to the rest of the Sunan and an Nawafil, such as the emphatic or the non emphatic, Arawati before and after some prayers, that it is not prescribed to pray them in congregation, but it is permissible to do so occasionally, not on regular basis. The Prophet ﷺ sometimes got up to pray at night, and uh, in a couple of narrations that Abdullah ibn Abbas spent the night in his house, so when he got up to pray, he joined him. Hudayf ibn Yaman in another hadith, it's a lengthy hadith, which he narrated that how long, how beautiful, how perfect was the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to the point that he wasn't able to continue because of the length of his recitation. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in another incident joined the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a night prayer which is nafila. When it comes to duha and the prayer before or after the fard prayers, if the person does that occasion for the purpose of motivating others, encouraging others, that is permissible, but it shouldn't be taken as a habit or a, a tradition. Sir Sally is allowed to speak bad about someone who's does without mentioning his name as means of complaining. I even asked her, to further explain, she said that if she is complaining to some of her friends about an incident that happened to her without specifying the person. We need to understand the concept of riba is defined by the Prophet peace be upon him as follows. Zikruka akhaka bima yakra is to speak ill of your brother or your sister in their absence. We speak about something that they hate to hear from you, and they hate to know that people learn about them. And as you understand that the hadith also has a continuation when somebody said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what if I'm saying about this person is absolutely true? He said, that, well, this is the backbiting. But if it was not in him, if you were forging something, if you were claiming something about him or her which didn't take place, that is called Bhutan or a slander, which is even a greater sin. So if the person is complaining to somebody in order to get him his right or to sort out this, their problems or to resolve their matters, and he's quoting what happened exactly and being fair in quoting what happened, even if you mention the name of the person, there is no problem in this regard. Because basically you'll be sitting together and eventually each one would narrate his or her story. In your case, that you are saying that you are not even mentioning the name of the person. So just complaining, chatting with somebody that this incident happened to you, there is no problem whatsoever in this regard. And this is not considered 
backbiting. Backbiting is if you mention the name of that person in order to defame uh, him or her or to make people look down at them. The second question that Sister Sally had presented was, if we have a food in our hands and there is a man eating from the trash, but we're scared because he looks crazy, are we sinning if we don't give him the food? No, you're not sinning in this regard. What is obligatory on the person is to pay their due zakah. As in the hadith, when the Badwin asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, about what Allah has ordained upon him with regards to the five, day, the five pillars of Islam. When he came to az zakah he said to pay so much in alms, illa an tasaddaq, if you want to give extra, that will be great, that will be highly appreciated by Allah for giving extra. If a person is willing to give extra, but in a situation like yours, you are worried that you may jeopardize your safety if you approach this person and he looks insane, he looks abnormal, so some, some bad may happen. So for avoiding a danger or a fitna or a trial that you're expecting, you're not blameworthy, especially your good intention is already there. If this person, whether it's he or she, were in regular condition and they are bagging or they are collecting food from the trash or they seem hungry, that you would have favored them over yourself, as I understood from your question. You would give him even your food, but you're not doing so in these circumstances because you're afraid that this person may harm you because of insanity or what appears on him or her as a state or condition of instability. There is no blame upon you. Brother Muhammad from Nigeria uh, presented a question and he said that some people go to so-called scholars in order to help them uh, and they ask them to pray for them. What is the ruling on this? I do urge the brothers and sisters to be very accurate and careful with the way they phrase their questions. Because Allah knows whether the person whom you're saying that so-called scholar is a scholar or not. And if you want to find out whether it is permissible to ask somebody to pray for you and to make dua for you or not, we can answer this question. But I'm not sure about the people whom you're talking about whether they are true scholars or not. Let me rephrase your question. Is it permissible to ask somebody else to pray for you? Is it permissible if you assume that this person is righteous to ask him to make dua for you? Is it permissible for a person who is more righteous to ask from somebody who is less righteous than him or her to make dua for them? Is it permissible? Well, let's see the references in this regard and you'll be able to conclude the answer. In Surah Yusuf, uh, Allah the Almighty uh, recounted what uh, the brothers of Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, asked from their dad, Prophet Jacob or Israel, peace be upon him. They said, قَالُوا يَا أَبَانَ اسْتَغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا خَاطِئِينَ they said, our father, istaghfir lana dhunubana. Seek forgiveness for our sins. Ask Allah to forgive us our errors of trying to get rid of our brother, uh, of envy and jealousy, of lying to you, of separating you from your son. We admit that we are sinners. Inna kunna khati'in. We studied before in the program of Guardians of the Pious, a hadith which is collected by Imam Muslim about Uwais al-Qawni, may Allah be pleased with him, the Tabi'i, whom we said that many of the scholars perceive him as Sayyid al-Tabi'in, whether it's him or Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib, as far as being the master of the second generation of this Ummah, Sayyid al-Tabi'in. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and Umar ibn Khattab narrated the hadith, and he heard him saying that, if you get hold of Uwais al-Qarni from Qarn, from Yemen, ask him to pray for you because his dua is mustajab. 
ask him to seek forgiveness for you. فَإِنْ اسْتَطَعْتَ أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرَ لَكَ فَافْعَلْ فَأَتَى أُوَيْسًا فَقَالْ اسْتَغْفِرْ لِي Who did so? Umar ibn Khattab. When he kept searching for Uwais al-Qarni and when he met him uh, while he was coming to perform Hajj, he said, Ya Uwais, istaghfir li. After he verified his identity, he said, seek forgiveness for me. We know the Hadith. Also, in another incident in a sound Hadith, um, but let's take a few calls first, then inshallah I will continue with this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sister Emma from Nigeria, Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for asking, Sister Anna. Yeah, thank you for giving us this uh, opportunity to ask. I have a question, please, um, if you can answer me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like three years ago, I had uh, something like a, a family issue. It's like a fight with my uh, brother-in-law and his, uh, his wife uh, because of... Uh, the way she was behaving in front of my husband, the way she was um, uh, acting. And uh, since then, we don't talk. I don't talk to his uh, wife, uh, okay? Uh, but my husband talked to his brother. There's no problem. There's no problem with, the, with his kids. My, my kids talk to his kids because I don't want to uh, God forbid. But I don't talk to her since then. It's like three years, uh, since three years, we don't talk to each other. She came to me and she tried to say uh, sorry, but I, I couldn't forgive her. It's not because of the forgiveness itself. Uh, the issue is, uh, I feel if I forgive her, I will bring her back to our life. And I don't feel at all okay with uh, how she behaved in front of my husband. So I don't want to open the door again. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you understand what I mean. I guess. So I fear, I fear Allah if I'm, uh, if I'm doing a bad thing with uh, shutting her away. Um, okay. That's what I want to know. Am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Yeah, uh, okay. I hope you get my, um, my point. I did, I did. Thank you, Sister Oh, Thank Anna. you so much. Thank you. I'm so You're waiting welcome. to hear the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister... Um, Noor from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Good evening, Yashik. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam, brother Noor. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Um, I have uh, two questions to ask, Sheikh. Mm -hmm. um, my first question is concerning uh, Salah uh, in the forming of stuff, the first stuff that is formed behind the Imam. So it's like, do we prefer, is it preferable for elder people? be in that stuff, or is there any hadith that forbids uh, young people from being behind the imam in the first stuff? That's my first question. Um, my second question is uh, concerning giving sadaqa. Like, who should be given sadaqa? Because uh, some people, like beggars on the street, who make it like uh, a sort of business. You know, they are always there earning the turn it into some kind of business. So who? Should we give sadaqa or should we just give it to the mosque? It's a bill of law. And those are my questions. All right. Thank you. Noor from Nigeria. Next, Assalamu alaikum. Um Jana from the case. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. Sheikh, you know, uh, it is our belief that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said that uh, we're the pictures of uh, uh, living uh, humans or animals, etc., are, then the angels are not. Okay? Could you have a show or an explanation about uh, pictures taking or viewing in, uh, in places like the masjids or where you make tawaf in Mecca uh, I would like to hear that ruling because it affects my Akida. Thank you very much Sheikh. Alright, thank you Sister Um Mujana um, Sister Emma from Nigeria had a conflict three years ago with her sister-in-law for a reason or another and ever since she's been not talking to her and she's worried whether that is considered as severing uh, the kinship. 
and the relationship with her uh, family members. Um, first of all, Allah the Almighty says in Surah Al-Hujurat, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ The believers are but brothers. So reconcile between your brothers if they have an issue that you may receive mercy from Allah the Almighty. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً So we should be brothers and sisters in faith. If there is a conflict for whatever reason, as long as the reason is worldly, the Prophet وسلم, said that we should set aside our conflict and we should reconcile even if we just maintain the minimum relationship which is exchanging salams, uh, visiting whenever it is necessary, during sickness, during, you know, if I'm invited. Um, he said, peace be upon him. فَيُعْرِضُ هَذَا وَيُعْرِضُ هَذَا وَخَيْرُهُمَا مَنْ يَبْدَأُ بِالسَّلَامِ He says three days, that beyond the three days, it is not permissible to boycott your Muslim friend, your Muslim brother, or if you're a sister, your Muslim sister. He said, after three days, it affects the acceptance of their good deeds. And he also said that Allah the Almighty likes more the person who would take the initiative. فَيُعْرِضُ هَذَا وَيُعْرِضُ هَذَا وَخَيْرُهُمَا the best of both of them is the one who takes the initiative. The one who begins the other by shaking hands or giving salam. As I said, we don't have to be like in family. She is not your mahram. And you do not owe her upholding the ties of kinship as a mahram. She is your sister-in-law. If you think that she is affecting your marriage life or she is uh, making a bad conduct at home, you can just accept her apology and keep a minimum relationship of exchanging salams whenever you meet and that's it. You don't have to invite her and you don't have to go to her house if you think that will affect your marriage relationship with your husband. But at least you should accept her apology and you should always exchange salam whenever you guys meet. حق المسلم على المسلم among the rights of a Muslim upon another Muslim that whenever he gets sick, عُدْتَ you visit him or her. So you maintain, as I said, the minimum requirement as a Muslim sister, not as a family member. Thank you, Sister Amma. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad from United Arab Emirates. Yes, what do you say? Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, thank you for asking, Akhi Muhammad. Go ahead. Uh, my question is about uh, Harut and Marut. Mm. They are uh, angel or uh, they are human? Mm. Mm. You got my question? Okay, yes. Thank you. Um, Noor's first question, who should follow the Imam in the line? The Hadith says, minkum wal Which means those who should pray right behind the Imam are the grown-up and the wise people. Those whom whenever the Imam has to step away for any reason. Let's say that he lost his wudu, or he started the prayer and he realized that he did not have wudu, so he has to step away. The person behind him immediately is the one who is ready to succeed him, to step in front of the row and resume leading the prayer. So when we have a child and he doesn't know what to do, it becomes very problematic. Also a person who is next to the Imam with regards to the qualities of Ahfaduhum, the one who knows more Quran, so that if the Imam errs, if he stops, if he needs a hand, the person behind him immediately will give him a hand, will correct him, not the person who's far away or by the end of the masjid. So the order that should be the grown-up and those who are willing because of their qualifications to succeed the Imam in case the Imam has to step out of the prayer. Assalamu alaikum. 
Amin from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Go ahead, Akhi. Yeah, um, I have a um, question about uh, Tahar, about during prayer, because when we play in basketball, uh, some of the kids, I've been trying to encourage them to play basketball, but some of them, they play with, um, play with their shoes. I'm just asking whether it's fine. Some of them, they will tell me, no, I just have um, pee, and it, I have a drop in my trousers, so is it okay to, 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 to put water and pray with you? And some well, of them uh, have you know, I, I got the first part praying with the shoes on, but you said put water where? Uh, no, no. You make a, if you go to Call of Nature and you have a drop ah. on your on your what on your on your underwear, what do you have to do to pray to join the Jamai? Like you have Maghrib prayer, so before you miss the timing. Mm. Yes. And the other one, if one is having bleeding in time, bleeding, can he just wash it and just make wudu and pray? All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amin, from United Arab Emirates. Um, Noor's second question is about to whom shall we give in a charity? Um, and he presented, you know, a suggestion that the beggars in the street who take this as a profession, no. And as a matter of fact, I did suggest before that we should not give such people because Basically, we're encouraging them to take this as a profession. And the number of such beggars is on the rise. And we keep hearing the news in Jeddah, uh, somebody who came as a carpenter, uh, maybe 15 years ago. And when, uh, when he had some trouble in the beginning, saving up some money, he started begging. And when he begged, and he realized that he makes more money from bagging than taking a job. He has taken bagging as a profession. And after bagging in the streets of Jeddah for so many years, he returned home where he bought a travel agency and he bought his wife an SUV as you know a gift to compensate for her. And he was proud of that. Um, in fact, there is a hadith a hadith, plural of hadith, warning against this practice. That a person who bags without need and he asks people for help frequently without need, he will come on the day of judgment. Nothing, no flesh will be on his face out of shame on the day of judgment. Um, and also the Prophet, peace be upon him, warned people again is asking for people's help is tiktharan because they think that they got a lot of money oh, this guy is driving land rover uh, let me just ask him. maybe he will give me 10 bucks do you need it no do you have enough food for a day and night i have for for a year so why do you beg because these guys are generous so now you find the street boys the street girls you know when somebody comes to me and say i'm hungry I need to eat. I say, no problem. I buy them food. But they're not interested in the food. They think that you will give them 10 bucks, 20 bucks. It depends on how sympathizing you are with their poor condition. So when they take this as a profession, they take the right of the poor people who are desperately in need, whom Allah the Almighty stated about them in the Quran. Ta'rifuhum bisimahum. And he said, لا يسألون الناس الحافة. You know them by their marks. They do not ask from people. But we are supposed to look for them. When Abdurrahman ibn Auf, may Allah be pleased with him, whose book, he had no money whatsoever. Then uh, Sa'ad, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, who is one of Al-Ansar, uh, offered him to give him half of his wealth, one of his houses, uh, and all of that. He said, Barakallahu laka fi malika fi ahlik. May Allah bless you in your wealth, in your home, in your family. Just show me where is the market. All what I need is a dinar. And he started, he started his business. And in no time, by the blessings of Allah, he became a multimillionaire from halal. When we encourage people to be lazy, not to do anything, rather to stretch out their hands and begging, 
we are partners in this uh, uh, catastrophe. So we're supposed to rather assist them to work. A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu begging for help. So he uh, said, what do you have at home? He said, I have uh, a rug and I have uh, a vessel. He said, bring them. Then he sold them, two dinars. He said, take one, buy an ax, and take another one and buy some food for your family. I don't want to see you for a couple of weeks. He went and he started doing, collecting the fire logs, uh, al-hatab, and he returned wearing dressing nice, mashallah, had plenty of food for his family. The Prophet Sallallahu said to him, that is better for you than begging from people whether they give you or they turn you down. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abdul Ra'uf from the KSA. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. Akhi, welcome to the program. Sheikh, I have a bad news. My sister passed away on 20th of uh, January, when I had requested you on 19th of January, that was Tuesday, to pray for my sister Rafika Abdullah, and she expired the next day morning. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. May Allah have and mercy on her. May Allah have mercy on her. She left three teenage uh, young boys behind, and I request you, Shay, to pray for her forgiveness, keep her sons in good health, and may Allah keep them steadfast on the deen of Allah. Pray for my parents and other family members to be patient during this time. And my question, Sheikh, is can we do Umrah on my sister's behalf since we are living, my brother and myself, in Kese? Mm. And who who else uh, can make Hajj on her behalf? Her children, any one of them who have not performed their own Hajj, can they do Hajj on their mother's behalf? Okay. Yeah, your question, uh, Abdul May Allah have mercy on your sister. May Allah make her grave a garden of paradise. May Allah forgive all her sins and take her straight uh, to heaven. Uh, if anyone is afflicted with the calamity of losing a loved one, just remember that we lost our most beloved, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Since Allah the Almighty said to him in the Quran, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتٌ And he said in another ayah, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَابِلِهِ الرُّسُلِ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ So the Prophet peace be upon him said in the hadith, if anyone is afflicted with a musibah, with a calamity, just remember my death. Because for the ummah that is the greatest calamity that the ummah has been afflicted uh, with. And the fact of the matter that لِكُلِّ أَجَلٍ كِتَاب uh, every person and everything has a fixed term. So once the term has come, no one will be advanced an hour or postponed an hour, as the Quran says. We rather say, as Allah the Almighty taught us, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We all belong to Allah and unto Him we shall return. Lillahi ma akhad wa lillahi ma a'ta wa kullu shay'in indahu bi ajalim musamma. To Allah belongs whatever He has taken. To Allah belongs whatever He has given. And everything with Him has a fixed term. May Allah have mercy on her, brothers and sisters. Let's go for a short break and we'll be back insha'Allah in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. strives to remain the premier English language Islamic channel. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. A quick reminder with our phone numbers, area code 0020238551 or 132. Um, Umu Jana from the case A is really concerned about taking pictures and images and whether that will prevent the angels from entering the places such as she mentioned even in the Haram. The restriction with regards to uh, keeping pictures hanging against the wall or keep statues at home, as it has been indicated in a couple of hadith. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was praying and there was a curtain which has an image of a bird. So this is painting or drawing. He ordered to be removed. In another hadith, when Jibreel, peace be upon him, abstained from entering his house because there was a statue and a dog. So he ordered them to be removed. And the Prophet ﷺ complied. But those images 
the still images on your smart devices, the hukm does not apply here, which are stored on your phone, on your computer, or in your photo album. It is not similar to hanging those pictures against the wall or displaying them or having statues uh, in any of the corners of your house. There is another thing now with regards to taking pictures in the haram. The only concern is, is a total disrespect to the sacredness of the place. Especially when you, when you find people completely distracted and also distracting others with taking selfies, taking pictures, asking some people not to cross before them because they are taking pictures, uh, displaying themselves like models. And I spoke about that repeatedly, even the sisters they stand inappropriate in order to take pictures on the way of people. That should be banned. And those who are entering the haram should understand that they are Allah's guests. They should be completely occupied with either the tawaf, the sa'i, the prayers, recitation of the Quran, making dua, istighfar, and so on. But keeping yourself busy and disturbing others with taking pictures and the flashes keep going off here and there and taking images of the clock tower and uh, the people are performing tawaf, you can get all those pictures for free online without making any effort. Panoramic pictures, the best photos. Keep your phone off when you enter the haram so that you can focus in your prayer. You can have khushu'a in your ibadah. I have done my hajj and umrah before the remodeling, before the renovations, before these tall buildings around the haram. And when the guards would not allow people using, uh, you know, classical cameras, they would confiscate the cameras. Why? Because they wanted to keep the peace in the haram. They don't want anyone to distract the attention of those who are praying. And those are doing the tawaf and the sa'i. It was cool. It was great. Nowadays, it's not only about taking pictures and also gathering people so that we can take selfie and stop in the traffic. The haram is very occupied. It's full. So asking people to pass so that we can take a picture and others and others and others is a mess. Also speaking on the phone out loud and raising your voice. You guys understand that with the construction going on and with the ta'af and the sa'i, you know, a couple hundred thousand people in the same place, uh, you know, at the same time. Those who are praying, those who are doing tawaf, those who are doing sa'i, those who are doing their act of worship. And you find somebody on the phone reporting to his wife or to his friend, you know, whatever is going on. And another during the prayer is waving before the camera so that his family may see them. They are missing the point. They are missing the point. They do not realize that this is a sacred place. This is the most sacred place on earth. This is the place which Ibrahim السلام, asked Allah Almighty saying, Rabbi ja'al hadha baladan aminan. So he asked Allah the Almighty to make this place as safe and as secure uh, place and city. Similarly in Medina, because of the blessings of the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, please I urge myself and all my beloved brothers and sisters, whether in uh, the Haram, Mecca, Medina, or any masjid, stop doing that. Stop disturbing yourself and disturbing others. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Brother Muhammad from Malaysia. Yeah, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you are doing well. May Allah always protect you, Shaykh. Same to you, Akhi Muhammad. Thank you for your dua. Okay. Um, I, got, I got two questions. Uh, the first question is, can we do the dua after salat? You know the dua, Allahumma anta salam wa akwa bin kasala. When, when we walk outside, we stand up and we walk outside, go back to our home. On the way, can we do the dua or must we sit down and finish the dua and go? Mm. Uh, and the second question is, uh, for the four rakat of sunnah prayer, can it be done one taslim, one salam? Mm. Okay, that's, that's, that's all. 
All right. Wa jazakum. Thank you. Barakallahu feekum. Um, um, I would like to answer Muhammad uh, from Malaysia first. Then, inshallah, I'll get back to the rest of the questions. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Ummu Musbah from the case. Hey, Assalamu alaikum, Sister Ummu Musbah. Welcome to the program. Go ahead, Sister. Uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, this is uh, regarding a question. Uh, actually, I have a contact from my uh, friend. Uh, who's, uh, she's a revert. Actually, it's a love marriage. Uh, I just wanted to ask, it's been 10 to 15 years she's been reverted. Uh, she's become a Muslim now. Uh, my question is, uh, she has, she wants to maintain good relations with her parents also. Uh, she wants to, be, uh, she's trying to become a uh, sincere Muslim. That is very much appreciable regarding her parents, uh, her children upbringing, everything, no doubt about it. But uh, my only uh, uh, doubt is from her side is uh, her parents, when they visit her, maybe they are indulging in idol worship when they come to her house. So how far can she compromise on this issue? Uh, like, is, can she allow her parents in her house to allow since they are born, uh, since they are still Hindu and they are not, they are not convinced with Islam? Uh, and she compromises on this issue with her parents. Although she is a very devout Muslim, when it comes to her children and herself also practicing, preaching everything, mm. when it comes to her parents. She is a bit reluctant from her side when it comes to when I have seen her closely. Uh, when they visit Saudi Arabia from India, when they come, uh, this thing they have to worship, and their mode of worship, as you know, they are idol, idol worshippers. Uh, they bring their idols so, with them. Yeah, they, are, they do idol worship. Do they bring their idols with them? Uh, I, yes, there could be some sort of arrangement which he is a little bit discreet about this matter. Right. I, I got a question, Sister Ummu Musbah. Thank you. Um, with regards to uh, Khitam salah or sealing of the prayer by making the adhkar after the prayer. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta adha al-jalal wa al-ikram. Then the tasbih, tahmeed, takbir, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. It is possible to make that after you step away, after you leave the masjid on the way to work, in the car, at home. But the greatest reward is when you make khitam salah in the same place where you offer the prayer. Because in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and after you pray, when you sit to recite your adhkar, Allah the Almighty appoints angels to supplicate for you. And he said, what do, th what do they say? They say, Allahumma ghfil lah, Allahumma arham, so long as you are sitting. Of course, if you have the leisure, if you have the time to do that, but sometimes if you take a leave from your work in order to offer the prayer and you need to get back, no problem. You can recite that on the way, in your car, at work. But bottom line is, it is highly recommended to recite such adhkar after the prayer. Um, with regards to praying the four rak'ahs connected, According to Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, he prescribes that the four rak'ah sunnah, like before us, to be prayed without uh, um, taslim in between. So the four rak'ahs will be all together with the middle tashahud, of course. The more right view is according to the hadith, Salatul layli wa nahari masna masna, masna masna, to pray two by two, whether it is during the day or during the night for the nawafil. This is permissible, and this is permissible, but what is better is to break them two by two, such as the four rakas before the two by two, and after the two by two. Barakallahu feekum. Um, Brother Muhammad from United Arab Emirates asked a particular question about Harut and Marut, and were they angels or human beings? Um, Harut and Marut, these two names are mentioned only once, in the entire Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 102, it's a lengthy ayah. It speaks about um, how the Jews claimed that 
Prophet Suleiman utilized magic and sorcery to lead his empire. So Allah the Almighty freed Prophet Suleiman from their false claim and he said that rather they followed مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ What Satan's claim of teaching people sorcery. But Suleiman, peace be upon him, was a prophet. He has nothing to do with that. And that's why he said, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ Prophet Suleiman was not a non-believer. Rather, Satan's were because they used to teach people sorcery. And they used to teach people the sorcery which were taught to Harut and Marut. The ayah says, وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ And what has been sent upon the two angels. So the ayah is very clear. Harut and Marut in Babylon, in Iraq, were two angels. So they were teaching people and they were warning people, saying that this is sorcery. Do not utilize it. Do not go, go by sorcery. Because it's evil and it is disbelief. This is what Harut and Marut were doing. And warning people against sorcery. While the, uh, the sect, this party of Bani Israel, who accused Prophet Suleiman of being a sorcerer, Allah the Almighty freed him from the sin and declared that he was a prophet and was a believer. But those who taught people sorcery, the Satans, and those who learned from them, their followers, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا Why? Because يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ Also in the ayah, Allah the Almighty, it is worth of mentioning that it is in the ayah that Allah the Almighty said, وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ The two angels, Harut and Marut, before teaching people and warning them against sorcery, they said this is a test. Do not disbelieve by utilizing sorcery. This is just to abstain from it. فَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ Allah spoke about the evil effect of magic and sorcery that it can part and separate between a husband and his wife and uh, it can cause a harm but by the end he said it harms no one except by the leave of Allah. And sorcery in general, Those who learn sorcery, they learn whatever harms them, not benefit them. Um, I understand the answer is very brief, but because you only asked about Harut and Marut and who were they. The ayah is 102 of Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter. Brother Amin from United Arab Emirates asked about while playing basketball, it seems that he's a coach. I love basketball, by the way. Um, that praying with the shoes on, it is permissible, provided the shoes are clean. In the hadith, when the Prophet Sallallahu was praying and leading the prayer while his boots were on, <clears throat> then in the middle of the prayer, he took them off and he kicked them away. So the companions followed him in what he did. After the prayer was over, he asked them, what made you take your shoes or boots off? They said, we have seen you doing so. So we thought it has been abrogated. He said, if it was abrogated, I would have told you. Rather, Angel Gabriel, peace be upon him, came to me in the prayer and said that, that they had in the soul some impurities. And you understand that it is not permissible to pray with the impurities. And that would lead us to answer your second question. So that's why he took them off in the prayer. And he resumed his prayer. Which means it is okay to pray with the shoes on. Recently when, when uh, I posted uh, uh, a few images of uh, Huda TV staff having breakfast, then we had a soccer um, uh, uh, game 
And I was leading them in the prayer and everyone was praying with their shoes on. So many people asked, is it okay to pray with the shoes on? Yes, as long as they are clean. You don't take them, you don't keep them on while entering the masjid because it is furnished with carpets, it's furnished with rugs. But if you pray in the, in the field, if you pray in the street, you don't have to take your shoes off. It is like the rest of your clothes. Um, he also asked about, you know, the kids when they go to uh, answer the call of nature, they may have a drop of urine in their underwear. So is it okay to pray with the on? It is not okay. What is okay is make sure that you do not use a urinal while urinating. I know that the kids and the youth when they attend the game and they run back and forth to the locker room and they use the urinal, you do not use the urinal. It is not about a drop or two. Well, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, a drop would not really affect the validity of the prayer because there is um, like a minimum, a minimum uh, space or size for the impurity and, uh, and, and if it goes um, and if it goes bigger than that like a few drops the prayer will be invalid because taharatul al-badan and taharatul mahal is required the purity of one's clothes the purity of the spot the purity of one's body is required is a prerequisite for the validity of the prayer but now I'd like to broaden my answer to um, uh, alert everyone, do not pass urine while standing, especially using the urinal because it splashes uh, urine drops which soils one's clothes with impurities. Then the person doesn't know exactly where the impurities have uh, hit, so he has to wash his clothes off. But if somebody knows that he had a drop and he sees a spot of the, 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 the drop or the witness, wash it with a little bit of water, then perform wudu and offer your prayer. The person has to clean up his or her private part after urination or answering the call of nature so that they can uh, make wudu. Passing urine while standing, then zipping off your pants and resuming uh, making wudu, that's invalid. As a matter of fact, it is one of the two who have been tortured in the grave during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu because as the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Whether regards to if somebody bleeds from his nose, would that invalidate his prayer or wudu? No, according to the more right view, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, when he was stabbed, he was still bleeding, and he continued leading the prayer. And, uh, you know, it has been rated that in many a hadith that the companions whenever they were fighting on the battlefield and getting injured they would pray while bleeding it would not invalidate the wudu nor uh, prayer um, um, uh, there is only one question left so that we don't have any pending on the musbah from the case a Allah the Almighty ordered us to be good and beautiful to our parents even if they were non-Muslims but only in one condition and if they put a pressure on the person on their child to uh, abandon the deen or hinder him from the path of Allah so he must obey them in anything else except in this matter so inviting them over to visit and hosting them she will be rewarded for all of that no doubt upholding their ties she will be rewarded for that but make certain that she does not put their kids in harm's way by letting their parents, uh, her parents do worship idols in front of her kids, okay? Rather, she kindly should ask them that, uh, you know, in, in, in my house, we do this and we follow that. And she makes it up with them in other ways, like, you know, honoring them, giving them a great hospitality. If they do that in their bedroom, and they like themselves in, the, in their bedroom and they do not do it in public, we have no control over what people do in private. I'm talking about what people do in public, especially when it comes to influencing or affecting my children. May Allah the Almighty guide all of us to what is best.
وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Astaghfirullah